Neanderthals, classified now as Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, was a contemporary inhabitant of Europe at the time of our most direct ancestor, Cro-Magnon man. Neanderthals evolved in Europe over hundreds of thousands of years. They were able to make tools and to use them skillfully. They communicated and had burial rites. They were actually just as human as we were, but their physical aspect was somewhat different. If we could bring back a Neanderthal man today and dress him like us, he would still draw attention no matter where he went in the world. Conflicts between Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons probably lasted for a long, long time and only ceased when Neanderthals died out some 30,000 years ago. Their enemies, our direct ancestors, had simply prevailed over them. They had better tools and had created certain symbolic systems that allowed them to remain united and ultimately to survive. The conflict between Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons was not a military conflict. It was more like a competitive ecological struggle between species that practically relied on the same level of intellectual resources. Such a displacement of one species by another without violence is not an unknown phenomenon to biologists, for example. After competing for the same resources over thousands of years, Cro-Magnon simply took over the environment little by little. Over such a long period of time, Neanderthals were almost certainly not fully aware of their species' decline from one generation to the next. The world they came to was not so different from the world they left behind, but they realized that they were suddenly competing with another species. Little by little, Neanderthal groups broke up. They moved to other less productive areas, and their birth rate fell. When Neanderthal groups broke up, they lost contact and the ability to intercommunicate. This and their resultant isolation is thought to have been responsible for their extinction as a species. This newborn baby girl will inherit many of her physical features from her parents. The color of her eyes, skin, and hair will be determined by her progenitor's genetic traits. She will develop and grow up to be of a certain height. One day, around about the year 2030, she will become a mother, and her child will grow to maturity around the middle of the 21st century. This child, of course, will probably have children too, and if things turn out right, our original little baby girl will see her first grandchild around 2075. It's also entirely likely that one day, near the beginning of the 22nd century, she will be able to cradle one of her great-grandchildren. However, if we go back in time, where would the other end of the chain be? In other words, who would be the first female to give birth to the first Homo sapien? The development of biogenetics has been of tremendous help in unlocking the key to mankind's evolutionary process. The most revealing contribution was the so-called Theory of Black Eve, which was the result of studies made at the University of California at Berkeley in 1986. The Black Eve theory states that all human beings alive today came from a common ancestor, a female that lived in Africa around 150,000 years ago. This conclusion was reached on the strength of results from several studies on mitochondrial DNA, a type of DNA that resides not in the nucleus of a cell, but in a cell's mitochondria. Only females can transmit mitochondrial DNA to their offspring. This allows scientists to trace genetic lines backwards in time to what has been defined as our common ancestor, the mother of all Homo sapiens. The different varieties of human beings, commonly known as races, have only appeared in the last 150,000 years as humans adapted to different environments. Skin color, body size, and hair types are features that developed over time through the process of evolution.
Actually, there are no significant differences among the so-called races, and we probably shouldn't even use the term. The truth is, the concept of race is a cultural anachronism used by certain social groups to justify distinctions that really do not exist. The term race is unacceptable in science, and technically speaking, it cannot really be applied to humans. It is a term for veterinarians or for farmers. You cannot talk about human races as you talk about the different breeds of dogs or cats or other pets or animals. One main reason for this is because our species is the least heterogeneous species among mammals. Ours is a species with very little genetic diversity. All human populations are practically identical. Every human being is practically the same from a genetic point of view. Obviously, there are superficial differences, striking differences even, in skin color, hair type, and other external features. But really, those differences are the results of very minor genetic differentiation. From the perspective of our modest understanding of the concept of time, we found that natural selection works very slowly. However, that's not the case with the changes man has made to his environment since the time human intelligence began working at its current level. Humans who lived 100,000 years ago did not live that remarkably differently from humans who lived 2 million years ago. However, we only needed a brief 40,000 years to reach the moon, to compose great symphonies, and to clone living beings. Many scientists believe the catalyst and motor of such dizzying human achievement has been our ability to speak. Around 100,000 years ago, the humans who would eventually change the world migrated out of Africa. Until then, the differences between the people who migrated and those who stayed behind were essentially insignificant. Those who left may have somehow surpassed the others and thus prevailed over them. The secret of that supremacy was very possibly their ability to speak. A minute genetic change, a very slight DNA mutation, reshaped these hominids' larynx, tongue, and certain muscles. These, of course, are the physical prerequisites for speech and language. We humans reinvent our world every day thanks to language. The culture we have created, the knowledge we have accumulated over the centuries, and the technologies that improve our lives on a daily basis are basically expressions of the practical applications of language. Language is inconceivable on an individual level. It is only meaningful when used within a group. Language is therefore a social heritage. In fact, we humans might be thought of as merely complex data processors and transmission units. The ability to exchange information among individuals or between different generations gives mankind a group identity that has facilitated our passage through evolution. It's more than likely that this amazing feature was the key, some 30,000 years ago, to the prevalence of Homo sapiens over Neanderthals. And of course it will continue to be the engine that drives man's dominance over the next several thousand years. What are we going to be like in the future? Will we have a larger head than we do now because our brain will be bigger? Or will our legs be shorter because of all the automatic features of future locomotion? Will our teeth disappear if we eat only concentrated food? 
There may come the day when we actually create our own version of human beings. Or maybe we'll create, as many prominent writers of science fiction have suggested, beings who are half human and half machine. There is certainly a wealth of fascinating ideas on the matter. Perhaps it was Aldous Huxley who, in his 1932 novel, A Brave New World, imagined the most feasible future reality for mankind. The plot describes a future world inhabited by beings genetically programmed to accept the role their society sets out for them. It's a frightening scenario in which freedom is on the fringes of organized civilization, 